You may have met Stanley Kramer before when we talked a little while ago about some pictures of his which were successful. Well, tonight, we're not going to do that. We're going to do something which is extremely unusual for the BBC and something which, in fact, requires rather a brave man. And Stanley is a brave man inasmuch as he's come here tonight to uh, discuss with me the pictures of which he's made which were not a success. That's not easy to do. He's made pictures, perhaps you remember some of them, Champion, The Cane Mutiny, High Noon, and more recently, Not as a Stranger, which have gone down very well indeed. <coughs> but we're not concerned with those tonight. We have nothing to sell you at all. We're merely going to analyze rather coldly by means of direct questions and blunt questions why some pictures he's made didn't go down as well as they should. Now, uh, first of all, Stanley, why or what main contributory cause would you say is primarily responsible for the non-success of some of your pictures? Well, I... <laughs> Uh, that's a beaut to start with, Peter. I, um, I don't know what the main or contributory cause or causes were precisely. I think if I really knew, uh, I would seek to avoid them somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, be that as it may, uh, I only know this, that I would like to make this distinction, and I'm not dodging the issue. They were unsuccessful financially. Yes. But I truly believe that it does not necessarily follow that a film which is unsuccessful at the box office is of necessity unsuccessful to the people who created it. In other words, uh, I feel I can safely say for myself that those films out of which I got the most satisfaction were not those films which of necessity registered at the box office. Yes, I follow. Well, let's, uh, let's ask another question in that line. How much damage would you think possibly that critics may have done to your pictures? We've opened a substantial can of peas here. <laughs> um, it always seems when you think the critics are going to go with you, they don't, and, and sometimes vice versa. Uh, nonetheless, I think this. Uh, I'm not as a stranger, for example, in England, which is a case in point, a case in point for me at least. Not as a stranger has been one of the biggest grossing films uh, in London and environs in recent years. Uh, the critical reception uh, was not what I would have liked it to have been. It seemed to uh, be punctuated with a fear on the part of the critics of what the British public could get down easily in terms of a film which dealt with operations, etc., etc. Uh, in America, some of the companies have complained bitterly about the critics in New York. I think that this is really way off base and highly ridiculous. I uh, have never sought to take issue with the critics. Uh, it's hard to take issue with someone who writes a daily column or even a weekly one, I yes. found. Yes, indeed. But um, I feel that the critics have the right, uh, the, the, the inalienable right, to criticize. And I would not argue with that. But you would think that they don't have a right to say what the British public likes or doesn't like. Well, I only in view of the fact that occasionally the public reacts in a way which the critics uh, are quite wrong about. Uh, I think not as a stranger was a case in point. I, 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 I don't know how many people that kind of criticism kept from the picture, but I feel badly about the fact that because of its great receptivity in terms of mass public, that uh, they were wrong about what the British public would react to. Uh, this leads into other fields of conversation and talk, uh, but I, I feel most strongly that, that um, those people who thought that the British public would not be able to withstand the rigors of operating room scenes, etc., were really wrong. All right, Stanley, well, let's, let's take another branch of, of, um, of the people who might interfere with the picture to begin with. What about the censor? Now, he has a certain job to do, as you well know, well, yes, he has. How much damage could that could be done by... Well, I don't know how much damage. Let's put it this way. From Not as a Stranger, there was cut a shot of a heart, a beating heart. Uh, I don't know whether this was in good taste or bad taste or medium taste, but I feel badly that the British public was prevented from seeing this in view of the fact that it was manufactured for a dramatic purpose. And I would have wished, uh, truly wished, that the judgment had leaned the other way so that we might have had the judgment of the public instead. Yes, I, I don't think it would have been too much for them, and I lost that battle with the censor. Well, we'll come back to that, Stanley, in a moment. In, in the meantime, I think we ought to talk now about these pictures we're going to 
analyze rather coldly tonight. And uh, the first uh, one... Probably very coldly, I'm sure. Well, not too coldly. <laughs> anyway, the first of these pictures is um, the Three Musketeers, and uh, not the Three Musketeers, what am I talking about? Serrano de Bergerac. But what I'm trying to say is that we joined Serrano and his friends, we joined the Musketeers in a cake shop in the town where, well, you'll see what happens for yourselves. That was your first attempt at the classic, Stanley, or why did you make it? Well, uh, why do you make a film? Uh, I made it because uh, I think that Cyrano represented to me not a man with a large nose. Uh, I've been accused, as a matter of fact, of making it because of my own sensitivity on the size of my nose, <laughs> which is not true. Uh, well. Not the size, but the reason. Uh, but I think he represented any man who looks in the mirror and is too short or too fat or is without love or certainly, more importantly, uh, a man with a code of not I, no thank you. Yes. I think the no thank you speech, in addition to the first reason which I gave, was as responsible as anything to put that on the screen because I think it's, it's basic and it's important and, well, we felt it. Yes, I see. Now, what sort of a reaction did you expect to this picture? We expected a fantastically wonderful reaction. Uh, fantastically wonderful because Mr. Ferrer is a wonderful actor. He won the Academy Award on this performance. Uh, there was something less. Now you say, why, why, why? Uh, something less because I choose to believe that, that the people who made the picture, of which I was one, did not do the job well enough or substantially enough. Should there have been better supporting cast? Should it have been in color? Should it have been exploited better? I don't know which of the questions on, uh, or which of the answers on which to put emphasis, but uh, I would prefer that it be my fault because I will not have the distributor or the exhibitor uh, stick to that terrible, terrible argument this is a kind of subject which should not have been made. Yes. I would far prefer to say we didn't make it well enough. That, that you would pr prefer to say that, Sandy, but it may not be altogether fair, and let's face it, bad distribution can possibly affect a picture's success. Yes, but it isn't a question of fairness, it's a question of, an, a, whole, of a whole outlook toward the making of films. Any subject can be made into a film. It can make that bridge to a mass audience if the film is made well enough. And I really mean this, I, it's not a mock humility. I really mean that the maker has fallen short. It is a case of that and not of the subject matter not being suitable to be made into a film. All right, now you mentioned subject matter. This brings up another point, and I want you to answer it if you can fairly concisely. Yeah. Um, would you think it is wise or, or a good thing from your point of view to attempt to, I hate to use this <coughs> word, but to educate a cinema-going public into the classics? No such thing as educating a cinema-going public. Uh, I, I am neither so patronizing nor so self-centered that I think that I can educate an audience. I would say this much. One would hope with the making of a film like Cyrano in its failure that in the running at a mountain with a lance, which is what the making of a film represents in terms of education or changing opinion, yes. one would merely hope that after the film is made, some people said to each other, well, I never thought thought of it in that way before, or I didn't know this kind of subject existed, or I didn't know this kind of performance was possible. Well, That's yes, the I'm most right. that the maker can hope for. And would you concisely give us a reason why you think the picture failed? One quick word, could you do that? The one quick word is, I didn't make it well enough. Well, that's very modest of you, I think. However, there we are then. Now we turn to, so much for Serrano, we turn to another picture, the four poster. And this is a comedy picture, but we've picked a dramatic scene, in fact, in order to show you why, or the use of cartoon, to bridge a gap in time over the war years. Rex Harrison and Lily Palmer in a scene from the four-poster. Uh, a cast of two only in this picture. Stanley, that was quite a risk to, 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 to start with. Did you expect justification at the box office, or was it more in the nature of an experiment? Well, Peter, you, you see, you always expect justification at the box office. By that I mean that I, I don't remember ever consciously making a film which either through my own arrogance or otherwise I didn't believe would, would make that bridge to a mass audience. Uh, this one didn't. Uh, it was the work in great measure of, of a brilliant director uh, who unfortunately died uh, 
very untimely death, Irving Reese. Uh, the, the movement of the people, the cartoon idea for the bridging of sequence, that, that war uh, cartoon, while it's out of context, was, was really the use of modern painting in terms of transitions in time. And that was his idea, and, was it? Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. uh, it started with a puppet idea, strangely enough, of using puppets and then went into the cartoon development. Oh, I see. Uh, the cartoons were made separately from the rest of the film by a cartoon company, but they were designed by us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, occasionally something happens with a picture. Some pictures you make and they fail and you say, well, uh, it's too bad, I mean, what's the next one? This was one of those pictures which in failure had a way of ripping your stomach. I mean, you suffered and you saw that the people didn't react as they should and you wanted them to react and you tried to force the issue, you know? Yes, I do. And it, it didn't come off. I, I think I made a mistake. I made the ending of it perhaps too maudlin. I was trying to wrap up the story of a marriage and I believe I permitted the, the, the ending to go too maudlin. Now, that wasn't Irving's fault, it was mine. We argued about it, as a matter of fact. Uh, that's the way it was. Um, still, I think in the use of this cartoon technique uh, for bridges, that very possibly uh, that contribution of Irving's will sometime again be used in a successful film by some. Well, I hope so. It was very interesting indeed. And talking of, of cartoons, it brings us rather to the question of music. Would you just tell us a little bit about the use of, or advantage and disadvantage, if you like, of background music in a picture? Well, I'm, I'm something of a nonconformist in that regard, I think. Um, <laughs> there are people who say that, a, that a, a music score in a film, in order to be really uh, well geared to the film, should really just be sensed, not heard. I've always felt that that was a dimension which was lost. I've always liked to use music uh, very powerfully in a film where it would illustrate a point or, or, or make, make more poignant a scene through the very use of the music itself so that you heard it, that it was a really auditory thing. Yes. Now, in Champion, it worked. We scored a prize fight. And uh, to score a prize fight and take out the crowd noise at that time was quite a step. Tiomkin scored that. It was a magnificent job, uh, and only with brass. Uh, in Home of the Brave, I think that we use music incorrectly by trying to do something powerful with it. In Four Poster, I think it was used perfectly. It was a, if the picture had been successful, Tiomkin, who did the score for that one too, would have received many accolades, in my opinion. Unfortunately, in Hollywood, uh, Maybe it's this way all over the world, I don't know. Uh, well, but unfortunately, it has to be a successful picture, it seems, to gain recognition for the various artists yes. down the line. Well, now here, Stanley, I want to, I'm sorry, we don't have much more time to talk about the full press. Mm -hmm. so we want to move on now and talking again of I music. Guess, yeah, well, fine. Well, it's <laughs> on now to the 5,000 fingers of Dr. T. Now, in, yes. this, you know this? in this mm -hmm. shot, we see the small boy hero trying to escape from the clutches of his tyrannical music. He sees as a kind of ogre. Tommy Riddick is the boy with Mad Ballet and the Five Thousand Fingers of Dr. T. Another experiment of yours, Stanley? Uh, what can you say? This was, the, this was the dream of dreams which fell very short. Uh, to put together Eugene Loring, the dance director, and Frederick Hollander for music, and Dr. Seuss, uh, Ted Geisel, who designed this film, and to do it in Technicolor and do a fantasy, which is what they say closes on Saturday night, like a satire, we tried it, mm -hmm. and uh, it didn't come off. Do you think that the, the, the public took it too seriously? And people like myself, <laughs> I went to see it and various others. <laughs> they took Did it we? seriously, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there are many worthwhile things. This ballet, I, I really believe this ballet in color was a brilliant thing, and uh, Loring and Hollander deserve a lot of credit. I don't consider it a failure. It was an advance, really, I think, in that branch of picture making. Well, I must be inclined to agree with you because I saw it myself and that's one occasion. It grossed, one. incidentally, minus six dollars. <laughs> minus six in the end. Well, Stanley, let's move on. It's rather a painful subject to you, I think. We'll talk about, if we may, Member of the Wedding. This picture yeah. starred Julie Harris. And in the clip you're going to see now, we see her as the adolescent in the confines of the kitchen, <coughs> confiding her dreams to Ethel Waters. It was Julie Harris and Ethel Waters in a scene 
from Member of the Wedding. Now this is a picture, Stanley, which uh, once again you're tackling your psychological favorite, you know, your favorite psychological problems. Did you have, as I rather felt, a sort of a message maybe you wanted to put over? It sounds rather peculiar to put it like that, but you know what I mean. Well, yeah, you know, uh, the exhibitor and distributor say messages are for Western Union. You know, uh, uh, I, I think every film has a message that's, that's worthwhile, and I don't mean a preachment, I mean just that it says something. Uh, I figured it this way on this picture, uh, wrongly. I thought that the, the fragile writing of Carson McCullers with the performances of people like Julie Harris and Ethel Waters would, would allow us to make that crossing of the gap again to mass audience. Uh, we didn't go after this picture hard enough. This girl, Julie Harris, is one of the magnificent actresses of our time. I regret that the film which she made for me, which was her first film, was not successful. She deserved a better fate. Mm -hmm. She'll have it yet, I think. Well, I agree with you. She's a wonderful actress, certainly, and so indeed in that particular snip we saw with Ethel Waters. But um, another point, do you feel that possibly um, if you go to a cinema, if anybody goes, they don't want to see great acting coupled with a psychological problem, but they want to be taken out of themselves and entertained. Is that a, a point? Well, uh, entertainment is something wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to be, you, you're taken out of yourself by not only something which is the cliche of entertainment, but it seems to me that an audience is entitled to a few surprises occasionally. Yes. Uh, uh, I believe more so than ever today. Uh, this, this ogre on which we are operating right now, known as television, has put the challenge down sufficiently to the motion picture industry that it is either going to pick up the gauntlet or we shall all steal quietly away into the night. I don't think just by making a big screen, which is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, <laughs> evidently, uh, that that alone is going to be the solution. No, I we're going to have right. to do subject matter which means something. Absolutely. And I entirely agree. Uh, would you care to say why you think this particular picture failed? Any great Julie thing? Harris and Ethel Waters, to an international motion picture going mass audience, were unknown. Mm -hmm. This was a piece of subject matter which they did beautifully. It was beautifully directed, beautifully written. Uh, we were not able to find the key to attract people into the theater. Word of mouth never got started because nobody came in the first day. That was our fault because we didn't merchandise properly. That's my opinion. Yes, well, it's a pretty good one. Just how much can you do by merchandising? Well, uh, the producer nowadays not only makes the picture, but he should travel around the world to sell it, in my opinion. Yes, well, that's a pretty good point. I'm sorry I haven't got one to sell right now. Well, <laughs> we'll come to that, no doubt. So anyway, we move on, Stanley, shall we, to, to the All last right. uh, picture you're going to see an excerpt from tonight. And this is The Happy Time. It's the story of a, a family, the sort of family that you and I just wish we could meet, perhaps. And in this snip, you'll see Charles Boyer describing to his young son the basic facts about life. Mm. So then, that's the happy time, Stanley. Why did you make this picture? Well, I, I, I really think that you just saw the reason I made the picture. Uh, you know, b believe me, Peter, uh, many times people have said the happy time, that was another box office lemon. And somehow, uh, I give you my word of honor that, that every time I think of that scene, uh, it soothes the pain, and, and I, I just don't feel it at all. Um, it, uh, the picture was not made just to be a comedy, and it, had, it was a delightful comedy in the, on the New York stage. Mm -hmm. It was made because I felt that, that the American viewpoint uh, in terms of sex, the adolescent, the mention of it, was really so basically non-adult that I thought that by being able to do this kind of thing, and we had a lot of trouble with the American censor on it, mm -hmm. I thought that by being able to do it that um, it would be what you termed earlier a message. Yes. But uh, you see, that's not a message. That was a uh, scene beautifully acted by Charles Boyer, I think. Well, I agree with you. And Stanley, now I'm afraid <coughs> time is running out. I have just two minutes in which I want to ask you three questions. Why did this picture fail, first one? This one? Mm -hmm. Uh, this failed because uh, I think that we did not uh, handle it as an important film. I think that the advertising and approach to the public was on the basis of a much thinner and lighter, smaller picture than the theme really called for. Fine, and 
This probably is going to be a difficult one for you to answer. Will you still continue to pursue the doubtful moneymaker, the doubtful success? I, uh, I, the only way I can answer that is this, that I will probably continue to pursue them because when I pursue them, I don't think they're doubtful at the time, you see. That it's I only understand. in retrospect that they seem doubtful. Yes, of course. All right, Stanley, and finally, I'm going to thank you for coming along in just a moment, but do you have a, a, a parting shot? Uh, Peter... A parting shot uh, on such a, a story of ashes <laughs> could, only, could only be this. Uh, I think that after all the years, and I've been in the motion picture industry a number of years, the only thing I can say is this. There isn't any formula or answer <clears throat> to what makes a successful or unsuccessful film. I think that it's one of those things in which the creator must satisfy himself on the theory that by satisfying himself, he will, if he's worth anything, a good part of the time satisfy the audience. Well, thank you very much indeed. And on your behalf, I'm going to thank you very much for coming along and subjecting yourself to a barrage of very direct questions indeed. Thank you. It was grand of you. Thank you so much, Stanley Kramer. Thank you, Peter, and everybody. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>